13 Lectures on General History of China by Liu Zheng Chapter 12 in the Modern History of China 1. The Establishment of the Republic of China Government in 1905. Sun Yat-sen, 1866 to 1925, and Huang Xin, 1874 to 1916 decided to convene a meeting for the establishment of Chinese Revolutionary League in alliance with revolutionary social groups including the Revive China Society. The China Revive Society, the Restoration League, and the Everyday Learning Society. He later described this as the three principles of the people, namely, nationalism, democracy, and the people's livelihood. He pointed out that nationalism meant national revolution with a combination of establishing a unified capitalist country and anti-Qing government ruling actions. While democracy meant political revolution against the feudalist autocracy with the aim of establishing a capitalist republic political system. The national and political revolutions in China must be bound together. People's livelihood, or the right to equal land rights, meant initiating social revolution to avoid social problems stirred up by the internal contradictions of capitalism. The Qing rulers responded to the rising democratic revolutionary sentiment with some countermeasures. In the first instance, they tried to gain support from constitutionalists, and in the second, they put down revolts and struggles between different localities. Ever since 1900, when the Qing government had published the new policy, the limits on national capitalist development had been relaxed while the centralized feudal rule had been strengthened and external relations mitigated. Yet this measure worsened the divisions inside the central ruling party. As a result, local forces such as the one commanded by Yuan Shikai seized their chance and grew stronger, thus intensifying domestic conflicts and the revolutionary situation. Under these circumstances, the Qing authority had no choice but to accept the proposals put forward by constitutionalists and to announce the adoption of a preliminary constitution. In November 1908, when the Emperor Guangxu and the Dowager Empress Cixi passed away in close succession, Constitutionalists of different provinces took the opportunity and launched a peaceful petition calling for the Convention of Parliament. In 1911, a responsible cabinet consisting mainly of members of the Manchu royal family was formed. This left the constitutionalists totally disappointed and made them turn their sympathy towards the revolutionists. Among these protests, the Sichuan movement was the one which evolved into an armed struggle. However, revolutionary groups initiated an uprising and swiftly occupied Wuchang, Hanyang, and Hankou cities. The leaders announced the establishment of the Hubei military government and changed the name of the country into the Republic of China. They also called on other provinces to revolt and overthrow the Qing government. The Wuchang Uprising was an unexpected success. Upon hearing this news, Sun Yat-sen returned from overseas and deliberated over the establishment of the Republic. On New Year's Day 1912, the Republic of China was formally founded, with Sun as its president. Ever since then the rule of the Manchu, together with 2,000 years of authoritarian centralized monarchy, has been things of the past in China. However, 
through elections and political negotiations. Yuan Shikai became the President of the Republic of China. Then, Dr. Sun Yat-sen launched the Second Revolution, aimed directly at Yuan Shikai, the Northern Warlords, and their autocratic rule. Unfortunately, there was a great disparity of strength between them. Two months later, the Second Revolution was put down by Yuan Shikai, and Dr. Sun Yat-sen fled to Japan. In the end, Yuan Shikai decided to restore the monarchy and to abandon the republic altogether. But his restoration went against the tide of history and did not even receive support from Duan Kirui, Feng Gojong, or any of his former loyalists. Being utterly isolated and encircled by strident opposition across the country and campaigns calling for a return to the Republic. Yuan Shikai died after reigning as emperor for a mere 83 days. Vice President Li Yuanhong succeeded to the presidency after Yuan Shikai's death, appointing Duan Kirui as premier. The Provisional Constitution of the Republic of China and its Parliament were restored in name, though in reality, state power was still in the hands of the feudal warlords. And China sank into long-term social turbulence. Among the northern warlords, there existed several factions, with the strongest one known as Wan being led by Duan Kirui and the second strongest Ji being led by Feng Gojong. In the northeast, Zhang Zuilin headed an in-group known as Feng. In the southwest, factions of non-northern warlords also formed in different areas. Dian was drawn together by Tang Jiao and Gui by Lu Ranjing among others. Large and small independent military forces emerged in almost every locality in order to seize power at the center. The northern and southern warlords and their factions launched fierce battles both openly and covertly, causing nationwide chaos. Zhang Xuan, the provincial military governor of Anhui, and a persistent supporter of the monarchy, marched into the capital city with his troops in the name of mediating contradictions between President Li Yuanhong and Premier Duan Kirui. Li was forced to step down in June 1917. Then, he and Kong Yuwei staged a comeback, reviving the Qing political system and restoring the dethroned Emperor Puyi on the first day of July. Twelve days later, Duan Kirui appointed himself as the commander-in-chief to crusade against the Restoration and Rebellion. His army rallied in Matsong, Tianjin City, driving away Zhang Xuan and putting down the rebellion after entering the capital city Beijing. The twelve-day political farce thus came to an end. Doctor. Sun disclosed the true nature of Duan Kirui's military dictatorship and vowed to overthrow the fake republic and to restore the true one. He called for actions to restore the provisional constitution and parliament, traveling from Shanghai to Guangzhou. He convened an emergency parliamentary congress with congressmen who had moved to the south and started the Constitution Protection Movement after forming a constitution protecting military government. Having no army under their control, Dr. Sun and his followers could only rely on the southern warlords, the rivals of the northern warlords. Once the two rival groups came to terms with each other, the movement would collapse in failure. Unfortunately, that became the case. 2. 
The new culture movement and the flourishing and contentious intellectual world a range of modern cultural pioneers sprang up and launched a much more vigorous movement of new democratic culture in opposition to the old feudalist culture. Their representatives were Li Dajiao, Chen Dushou, Hu Shi, Lu Xuan, among others. Chen Dushou founded the New Youth magazine in September 1915 and began the New Culture Movement. The New Youth magazine was the nexus of the New Culture Movement. In an article in its first issue entitled, Notice to Young People, it put forward the slogan of human rights and science and raised the twin banners of democracy and science. What these pioneers meant by democracy was the capitalist democratic system and its way of thought. Democracy was a weapon in their attack against the feudalist autocratic system. What they meant by science was learning Western science and technology and using scientific methods to understand the world. As the new culture movement advanced, the revolution in literature was also brought up on the agenda. In the first of January 1917 issue of New Youth magazine Hu Shi published an article entitled, My Humble Opinion on Literature Reform which advocated vernacular literature and reforms to literary form. Chen Dushou put forward an even clearer slogan for the revolution in literature when he called for replacement of aristocratic literature by realistic literature. Li Dajiao published an article, what is new literature, in the New Youth magazine to deeply elaborate the basic features of realistic literature. In novels and essays such as A Madman's Dairy, Kong Yi Ji, and Medicine, published in succession in the New Youth magazine. Lu Xuan adopted plain and everyday vocabulary and literary techniques to disclose the true nature of feudalist moral orders and to depict the widespread mentalities of ignorance, numbness, and meekness among people of low social status. All of the aforesaid authors left a shocking impression upon readers and contributed to the revolution in literature. The new culture movement was mainly concerned with the ideology and culture of Chinese society. It also touched upon democracy and science, morality and ethics, customs and traditions, culture and education. Its major purpose was to fight the countercurrent of showing respect for Confucius and for reading the classics in the ideological and culture fields. At least, there existed a common knowledge that the reform of traditional Chinese culture must depend upon the spirit of Western science and democracy to succeed. As was pointed out gravely by Chen Dushou, science and democracy must be used to save China from darkness in politics, morality, academics, and ideology. The new cultural pioneers told the Chinese people clearly that China must uphold the banner of science and democracy to go along with the international trend of modernization. In addition, Chinese people must accept the concepts of Western democracy and science, realize equality by law, independence ethically, and freedom in thinking and get rid of superstition and blind faith in academic work. Only by doing so could China experience revival and the Chinese nation be rejuvenated. In the latter half of the new culture movement, there was an upsurge in the study, learning, and spread of Marxism and Leninism. 
China's diplomatic failure at the Paris Peace Conference in May 1919 was a direct cause of the outbreak of the patriotic and anti-imperialist May 4th movement. The emergence of the May 4th movement represented the turning point for the Chinese Democratic Revolution. It marked the end of the old democratic revolution and China's failed attempt to follow the Western path towards modernization. From then on, a new democratic revolution began and the Chinese revolution entered a new era. After the new culture movement, various cultural factions were keen on questions of social reform. The KMT government in Nanjing adopted Dai Jitao's thought as its ideological and cultural basis. The national government passed a resolution to respect Confucius throughout the whole society and launched a new life movement to promote the virtues of politeness, righteousness, integrity, and shame in people's daily life. Liang Shuming's 1893 to 1988, rural reconstruction theory and practice was distinctive. He believed that in order to realize the dream of revival, Chinese people could only follow the path of agricultural civilization but not the Western road under the guidance of Western culture. The development of China should start with a socio-ethic mutual insurance system, followed by village self-rule, and then the expansion of small-scale self-rule to large-scale rule. Gradually applying this principle to the whole society, until a rural civilization was realized in the end. The fundamental issue of rural construction lay in a new social organization which could unite all residents of a village. The target of this plan was to build a healthy and complete rural society. To develop the rural economy, and to facilitate the evolution of the nation into a modern industrialized country on the basis of rural economy. The origins of the rural construction theory still lay in the concepts of traditional patriarchal ethics, blood, and family ties. In the spheres of Chinese ideology and culture, those who looked up to Western culture, social freedoms, and democratic politics were known as the liberals. They tried hard to make modern Western social-political theory the guiding ideology for the building of Chinese society. Hu Shi was a representative of Chinese liberalism. His political attitude served as the middle way in social practice. Owing to the fact that his political requirements and ideas did not conform to the social reality of China and it was unrealistic for China to copy the model of Western countries through peaceful means such as reform. 3. Victory for China's Democratic Revolution The most resounding slogan of the May 4th movement in 1919 was punishing traitors and fighting for national rights. As a matter of fact, this large-scale mass campaign was mainly directed against imperialist invasion and the military autocracy of the Northern Warlords. This movement also witnessed the establishment of communist groups in Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, and many other cities. With the organization and publicity efforts of these groups, Marxist theory gradually became integrated with Chinese revolutionary practice and the rising working class movement. It was against this theoretical and social background that the Communist Party of China, CPC, was founded on July 23, 1921. From then on, a core leadership for Chinese democratic revolution and socialist construction came into being. 
with the help of the Comintern and the CPC, drive. Sun Yat-sen reformed the Nationalist Party or Kuomintang, and convened the first National Congress of the KMT in Guangzhou in 1924. During this session of the Congress, he put forward three major policies of uniting with Russia, the CPC, and helping farmers and industrial workers. He opposed invading foreign forces, called for a fundamental solution to farmers' land problems and the realization of the idea of land for all who farmed. He also stood for unity with farmers and industrial workers and relied on them in the fight against the autocracy of the northern warlords. After this Congress, there was initially close cooperation between the CPC and the KMT. The two parties formed the Northern Expeditionary Army in the summer of 1926, and within a very short period of time. They had defeated the main forces of the warlords Wu Pifu and Sun Xuanfang. At this stage, the Communist Party accepted the instructions of the Communist International Organization to infiltrate and divide the Kuomintang, which caused Chiang Kai-shek to launch a coup and launch an action to clear the Communist Party. The national crisis deepened as the social conflicts within China grew more complicated. In 1931, Japanese invaders brazenly committed what became known as the September 18th Incident. With the effect that within three months, the total territory of three northeastern provinces had been trampled. Not long afterwards, in 1935, Japanese launched a new invasion upon China which became known as the North China Incident. At this critical time, national salvation organizations involving various social groups and circles came into being. And many people shared the common aspiration of ending the civil war and fighting the invaders as a united front. The Xi'an Incident occurred in 1936 bringing the 10-year-long civil war to a close. And a united front was formed to fight against Japanese invaders. After initiating the attack which became known as the Marco Polo Bridge Incident, Chichi Shibian, on July 7, 1937. The Japanese invading troops launched a full-scale attack on China and ignited the anti-Japanese war. In the frontline battlefields, the KMT troops and compatriots bravely and enthusiastically struck against the invaders who largely outnumbered them. Wars in the front line attracted the major forces of the Japanese and created favorable conditions for the opening of a new battlefield by the CPC behind enemy lines. The 8th Root Army and the new 4th Army under the leadership of the CPC went deep into the northern and middle parts of China behind the Japanese front line and set up a number of anti-Japanese bases. In 1944, after arduous defense and periods of deadlock, the Chinese began an all-out fight back against the Japanese. The Japanese imperialists declared surrender in August 1945. The eight-year-long anti-Japanese war came to an end. Tremendous changes took place in both the international situation and the domestic political situation in China after the victory in the anti-Japanese war. A large-scale civil war broke out again in June 1946. Victories in three of the most famous battles in Chinese modern history, the Battle of Liaoshan, the Battle of Waihai, 
and the Battle of Pingjin laid the groundwork for the crossing of the Yangtze River and the liberation of the whole country. On April 21, 1949, widespread battles broke out along the Yangtze River, and the People's Liberation War ended in triumph all over China. On the eve of the imminent victory in the War of Liberation, the CPC convened its second plenary meeting of the 7th Party Congress in Zibaipo, Pingshan County, Hebei Province, in March 1949. This meeting prepared the party for the mission of building a new China in terms of ideology, organization, and policy. The Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference was held in Beijing in September of the same year. This finalized the nature of the regime and agreed on several domestic and foreign policies. The founding ceremony of the People's Republic of China was held on October 1.